Hey friends, welcome to the AMA stream to celebrate 100,000 subscribers. We actually reached that number right on years, so it's a little bit over that now. But I still can't believe we made it so fast and I'm grateful for all your support. Can everyone hear me okay? Is the BGM too loud? Let me know if there's anything wrong with the sound. Anyway, this will be more of a laid back conversation type of stream and I'll be answering questions from this post I put out on Twitter a while back. So thanks to everyone who submitted one. Yeah, I'm, I see you chat. That's really awesome. This is also my first time streaming. So um, there's going to be hicc there's going to be hiccups here and there. I'm a little nervous and very excited as well to do this. So enjoy. And also um, I received so many questions and unfortunately I don't think there'll be enough time to answer them all but we should be able to get through quite a bit today and also I thought the screen looked a bit lonely so I brought along an assistant today by the way she's not Ori if anything Ori is probably the cat she's holding until he decides to either create a proper VTuber body or buy a camera Anyway, today there were some questions that I first wanted to dive deep into, um, followed by some more rapid fire type questions. And let's, yeah, I think that's it. So let's get right into it. So our first deep dive question comes from Akuya. Do you have any advice for consistency and drawing every day? I'm in this loop where I'll draw something and it doesn't turn out good. So I'll get discouraged and stop drawing. And then I come back and because I haven't practiced, it'll still look bad and I'll stop again. So we all have to go through this sort of beginner's hell whenever we're trying to learn something new. And we're just going to suck for a long time while we're still grinding EXP points and leveling up. It's like in games where we all start at level one and we've got to go through the tutorial stages first to even get a grasp of how the controls work and what the rules of the game are. Then we've got to start overcoming challenges and fighting monsters and earning those EXP points so we can get stronger. Art is exactly the same, except the difference is that games constantly give us feedback on how we're doing. I'm going to use Honkai Star Rail as an example since I'm really into it right now and they did a great job with their feedback indicators. And I'm just going to hide you for a second, Rio, because you're in the way. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, this is not sponsored by Hoyoverse or anything, but Hoyoverse, if you are listening and want to sponsor the channel, you can let me know anytime. Anyway, the moment you start up the game, it tells you exactly the next thing you need to do and where to go to make progress. You're never lost or fumbling around or and you're never like trying to find your way. And let me know in the comments if you actually play Honkai Star Rail. I want to know how many people that watch my channel are actually into the game and or playing games in general. Anyway, like with during battle, you also know exactly how everything's progressing. Your HP, the enemy's HP, the turn order, percentage likelihood a special effect is going to trigger, how many skills you can use. And when you build up your charge, you can use it to dish out a very powerful ultimate that not only deals a ton of damage, but you also get to see an awesome cutscene, like those voice lines, the sound effects. Oh, so satisfying to use. And not only that, after you beat a stage, you know exactly the rewards you get from all the battles and challenges that you do. The quests are really clear. You do this and you get this. And character progression is also super clear. You're currently at this level, you need these materials to get to the next one. And this all makes progression feel so smooth, stress-free, and extremely clear to us as the player. We know how to make progress, and even more importantly, that we are making progress at all. So, we want to play more. We enjoy making the progress and getting good at games, so we keep on playing. So having these feedback indicators are really important to the enjoyment and satisfaction we get from playing any game, really. But there's one problem. In art and in life, there are no clear feedback indicators telling us how we're doing. In other words, it's, it's, there's a Japanese term for this. It's kuso game or shitty game. Like there's no EXP bar. There's no arrow telling us where to go. The rewards of the practice we do often isn't clear. And we usually don't know from making progress at all until a very long time later. 
So it's literally playing like this. You're, you're playing the game with no UI and just imagine trying to play a game in this state. You're like, where is everything? Where do I go? Like, am I even heading in the right direction? It's literally a Kuso game because it'll take you ages to make any program, uh, any progress. And imagine doing combat with no UI either. You like have no idea at all how the battle is progressing. And this is kind of like art, to be honest. Like a lot of our day to day progress and improvement is often so tiny that it's invisible. Really, there's question marks everywhere, right? When, when you're drawing, it's like, I'm drawing all these crocky schedules. I'm doing all these artist studies, but I don't see the difference. Like, it's just these question marks. So what happens then is that we end up falling back to the feedback we can easily see, which is one, either how the piece turned out or two, the, the number of likes or reposts it gets. But these are really bad feedback indicators because first, we're just going to suck for a long time while we're learning the thing. Because if we're already good at it, we wouldn't have to learn. We wouldn't have to learn it to begin with, right? Like, would you, you know, if we could already do it, why learn it? And the second is that the number of likes we get isn't fully under our, our control either. Yes, the more we improve, the more likely people will resonate with our art and like it. But there's also the algorithm, there's trends, many, there's so many other things beyond our control. The feedback isn't clear. It's full of other noise. So, okay, yeah, the key here is to focus not on the outcome, but just on the drawing or doing whatever thing you want to get good at and trying to improve at it 1% each time. Because in order to get good at anything, we need to do the thing a lot over a long period of time. But that also means we're going to suck for a long time too while we're still learning it. And that's okay and to be expected. Because when you're new or learning something, of course you're going to suck. How can you be good at something you've never done before? If you could, like, like I said, if you could already do it, we wouldn't need to be learning it, right? So it's unreasonable to expect that you can make something good without first sucking at it while you're still grinding for those EXP points. So I think, Akuya, okay, yeah, the reason you get discouraged is that because you've made the goal to make something good when you draw. Which means that the thing you're using as, as feedback is either how the piece turns out or the number of likes or what other people think of it is. But as we just talked about, those are really, really bad feedback indicators. So instead, remind yourself each time you draw that the goal isn't the goal isn't to make something good. It's simply to draw and try to improve 1% each time, such as by trying out that drawing tip you saw the other day, or reflecting on your previous drawing and finding some small things you could do better next time. And it's by continuing it's by continuing to do this for a long time that you'll eventually achieve what you want, which is to have leveled up your skills enough through those small 1% gains that you can now consistently draw well. So thanks Akio for that question and I hope that helps. The second deep dive question comes from Honzak. Congratulations Ori on the incredible milestone. Thank you. I struggle with keeping up motivation to draw. It's not like I hate it, but every time I try to draw something and look at it, I feel very dissatisfied. It then results into a spiral of despair that I can't overcome. What do I do? Well, this is very similar to the previous question, I think. And if I can add one more thing, it's that you need to develop a growth mindset, which is the belief that if I put in time and effort, I can level up my skills at this thing. One of the best ways to develop a growth mindset is by adding three letters to the end of any sentence anytime you think you can't do something. So whenever you think to yourself like, I can't draw pose as well. I can't draw hair like the artist I admire. I can't draw backgrounds. You just need to add yet to the end each time. I can't draw pose as well yet. I can't draw hair like the artist I admire yet. I can't draw backgrounds yet. But if I put in enough time and effort, I will eventually be able to. Just imagine it, if you draw whatever thing that you want to get good at like a hundred times, it would be unreasonable for you to not be better at the thing, especially if you try to improve 1% each time. So everything is a skill that you can learn, but 
it takes time to grind those EXP points. So the real limiting factor is actually time. Which means that you can learn anything, but not everything. So you need to figure out what are the few things you really want to commit to and get good at. And another tip for you is to look at the um, to look at the progress that you're making with the entire journey in mind. You can't judge your progress by only a single point on the graph. Like you might be at a low point, and that sucks. But hey, if you look at the whole the journey as a whole, and if you continue to put in the time and effort, put in those practice hours, put in you know keep posting, keep drawing, you'll keep improving. And when you see your progress as a whole, you're actually leveling up along the way. So you can't just judge your progress by one of those points on the graph. So for you, Honzak, I recommend checking out the book Mindset by Carol Dweck, which goes through how to develop the growth mindset in detail. If you're not much of a reader, I can recommend listening to the audiobook version since you can listen to it while doing something else or during commutes. You can also listen to it at 1.5 to 2 times speed if you can keep up with it. Uh, there's also, I think, 3 times speed, but those sound like chipmunks and I, I, I can't do that. I can do two times, but not three times. But anyway, thanks again, Hansak, for the question and I hope you find it useful. The third deep dive question comes from Mono. Hi Ari, what is your advice when it comes to confront confronting some common fears in art? Posting art online, making bad art, etc. So I think with this is that Usually what we're afraid of is not posting the art online. It's not making bad art, but we're afraid of what people will think of us if we make bad art or post online. Essentially, the root of the problem is not wanting to fail and look bad in front of other people. I have two tips to help with this. First is that there's this thing called the spotlight effect which is the psychological phenomenon where you tend to overbelieve what other people, um, well, you overbelieve that other people are thinking about you more than they actually do in reality. So in reality, no one is actually paying that much attention to what we're doing because everyone is also under the spotlight effect. So they're way too busy spotlighting themselves too. This is also true for the art we post. We act as if everyone's going to stare at it and print it out and hang it up on their refrigerator. But in reality, most people only spend like a second looking at it before scrolling to the next thing. And to be honest, I also tend to overthink these things too and way overestimate how long people will actually be looking at the piece for. So you're definitely not alone here. The second tip is to just accept that sucking and failure is part of the journey. The only time it won't suck and we won't fail is that either we're already good at the thing or that we never do it at all. And most people choose to never do it at all. But in order to get good at the thing, you have to be willing to suck and learn from failure for a long time. So the fact that it's hard and it sucks is actually a sign that you're on the right path and that you're on the journey of learning and leveling up. Also, failure is simply just feedback telling us that, hey, we can improve at this thing. And if we choose learn, then it actually becomes EXP points for us. And that's what makes us better. And the third tip is that there's this thing called exposure therapy. It's unintuitive, but one of the best ways to, con to conquer a fear is to just face it head on and keep on doing the thing that scares us until it no longer scares us. For example, when I tried holding a conversation in Japanese with a native speaker for the first time, it was scary. Making tons of mistakes, not being able to say what I want and all that. But because I kept at it and I just kept on speaking and I just kept on trying and trying to learn, I started to get used to it. And because I kept doing it, I improved, which was really motivating. And since the better I got at it, the more fun it was to start speaking and having conversations in Japanese. So through this method, you can actually enter a positive feedback loop of doing the thing, improving, and because you improve, doing the thing becomes more fun, so you keep on doing it and improving. So I hope those three tips help, and thanks again, Mono, for the question. The fourth deep dive question comes from Vanessa. One of the videos I believe you mentioned about that you looked into numerous how to learn books to help you out for art studies. What are these learning how to books that you have read to help you out, to help you with it? Okay, so there's so many. Um, I've, I've read a ton of books. I was absolutely obsessed with figuring out how to learn. And I, I was 
trying to find the most efficient learning method. I don't know if that's just an obsession with me, but whenever I do something, I think it's also with games, right? Like I want to do this in the most efficient way possible. And I kind of carry that over to, to, um, to art and drawing. And that's why I started to read a lot of books. And out of all those, there's two that I recommend in particular. The first is Mastery by Robert Greene. This is the book that I come back to the most often. If I can recommend only one, this is it. One of the most important takeaways from the book is that every great master of any craft went through an apprenticeship phase lasting about five to 10 years where they were leveling up their skills. We are no exception if you want to master something. And so to expand on that a little bit more, what Robert Greene talks about in the book is that first you kind of find your life's task. Like, what am I uniquely good at? We're all we're all unique. We're all we're all humans. We're born with like different um, DNA. We're born with different parents. We were um, you know raised in different um, in unique circumstances. The way our parents taught us was very unique. How you know what we learned in school was very unique. So that all leads us to being able to find something uniquely to us. Once we find that, oh, I think this is the direction I want to go in. Then what we need to do is then go through an apprenticeship phase, which is as, AKA the grind phase, right? Where you're just doing training, practicing, learning nonstop. And you keep on doing that. And this is the longest part and also probably the hardest part of the art journey. Because we don't actually know how long this part will go for. Some people say it's 10,000 hours, but honestly, it could be more because what I really think the 10,000 hour rule is trying to tell us is that it takes a long time to get good at things. It's really hard to put a number because I think the number really depends on how, how many practice hours other people in the same field we're trying to learn at have been practicing for as well. So like if, if we're doing a really old, uh, like art, art's quite an old field. People have been training for 10,000, 20,000 hours. So then the bar for mastery then becomes what those masters have um, accumulated for, right? So it would be like 10,000, 20,000 hours, maybe. Anime art might be a bit, anime art's a bit more recent of an art style. So maybe it's, it's not as long as one of those traditional kind of paintings, but it's still quite a long time because, you know, there's people in the industry um, who've been drawing forever. Like think of the Final Fantasy, um, the artist for the Final Fantasy series, right? Who makes all these gorgeous covers. He's probably been at it for decades. So the, f the exact number of hours will really depend on how long people in that field have been doing it for. Um, oh, and if it's a brand new field, then you can reach master maybe 10, 100 hours. Maybe it's like there's a brand new field where you're making, I don't know, like robot cows or something, right? And completely new field, no one's done before. The moment you get like 100 hours in, you're, you're, you're the master. You're number one in the world. So it really depends. You can't put a number to it but it does take time. So you have to go through an apprenticeship phase. The other things in the book that I, uh, what makes it exceptional, um, I think is that he also talks about um, emotional intelligence. Like there's emotions, um, there's, we have to find ways to deal with our emotions. It kind of comes back to one of the, um, to some of the earlier questions where it's like, man, this feels bad that I'm, you know, like I'm not seeing progress, that the drawings don't turn out the way I want it to. Like, why does this suck so much? Like, how do I deal with this, right? That's, um, there's ways, I, th I think you don't fully get over it. I think it's part of being human that we, we feel these things that, you know, it, it sucks to suck, right? It, it just sucks. Like if, if we're bad at something, it's not fun game, right? We don't like any game. We don't like any game that we're bad at. And maybe Dark Souls is the exception where people like dying in that game and no, but then you, you're, you're, still, you're still learning, you know, you're still trying to get good at it. So in the end, we still want to get good at it and because we don't like staying bad. So I think it's a human thing. But what experts I found do is that they have really good ways to deal with it. So the growth mindset I talked about was one of the ways that you, you deal with it. So it's like when instead of feeling bad that, oh man, I'm not drawing well, you think I'm not drawing well yet. If I put in time and effort, I can get better. That's the way, um, that's the way people who eventually get good deal with these emotions that we all deal with. And this book does a great job at um, 
you know, talking through all those human emotions that we commonly will feel as we go on the path of mastery. He also talks about all the other kind of things like,、um, you know, like feeling,、um, feeling jealous, envious, all those things, like, I think, which is very important in our,、um, you know, in our generation since social media is such a big thing. Um, so, yeah, those, those I think is very important to learn as well. And this is one of the books that really cover it in detail. And finally, he talks about like the creative active phase and the mastery phase. But that's, that's like how to un- really unleash your creativity once you put in those practice hours and, and, and so on. So, he covers the whole journey with, it, with this book, and I definitely recommend it. So, must read for anyone that wants to get good at any skill like drawing or if you're just simply lost as to what you should pursue in life. Now, The second recommendation is Ultra Learning by Scott Young. I've mentioned some of Scott's work before in the Fastest Way to Learn video, and his book has a ton of practical tips on the best learning practices. It's quite up to date with the science, with all the research. And I, out, of all the books, out of all the learning books, I found it just so applicable. Like I, could, like I remember reading this book when I was very stuck on. I was very unsure of how. The learning mechanism works for drawing. Like, I, I mean, I've reached the conclusion now, which is draw, reflect, learn. But back then, you know, like, Ori hadn't, Ori hadn't made Ori's video on the topic. And so I was like, how does drawing work? People were like, do fundamentals, just, just do fundamentals, or draw a box, or take this class, buy this tutorial. Right? And it's like, everyone is saying different things, but there should be some fundamental principle, you know, like it's like Newton's laws of physics, whatever. There should be like one principle that everything binds by, right? And reading this book was what helps、um, reading mastery and ultra learning, both of them together, really helped solidify like these pr- best practices for the learning framework for art as well and pretty much everything else. So while mastery gives you a solid framework for the whole art learning journey, Ultra learning will help you optimize and fine tune the details of how you practice. But I would definitely go with mastery first. So, thanks again, Vanessa, for the question, and I hope you found it helpful. The fifth deep dive question we're going to go into comes from Ariyu and Les Rainey. Is your first language English or Japanese? You seem to be proficient at both. Are you Japanese? If not, can you talk about your experience with learning Japanese?、Um, you know, the journey to reaching a certain proficiency? Weird question, sorry. And also, congrats. Thank you. So, I was actually surprised at how often I got these types of I got these type of questions, you know, related to learning Japanese or speaking Japanese, since this is an art channel. But I guess people are interested, so let's dive into it. First of all, I consider English to be my native language. Japanese is something I learned. And I have JLPT N1 in it, which, for those that don't know, JLPT stands for the Japanese Language Proficiency Test. And it ranges from N1 to N5, with N1 being the hardest. I remember that test being really, really, really hard when I took it a couple of years back, but I somehow passed it on the first go. This is not pre recorded, by the way. I am doing this live. <laughs> but for the deep dive questions, I wrote down. Be- A lot of structure because there's a lot of、um, tips, learning frameworks that I wanted to cover. So I want to make sure I had that done in detail. But later on for the rapid fire questions,、um, I just have you know, a few notes. So I'll be doing those more impromptu. And hopefully I can read the chat a bit more while doing those. Okay. So I actually also speak a third language. I wonder if anyone in chat can. Guess it. So I'm reading the chat for this. I want to see if you can guess what's the third language I understand. Oh, I see some. I see some. I see the correct answer. There's, I think, one person. One person had the correct answer. Yeah, two people have that correct answer. Cool. I actually understand Indonesian. It's good enough to watch Hololive ID streams, but I'm really bad at speaking it. So I would, you know, my English is native, my Japanese is pretty good. 
and my Indonesian is terrible but good enough to watch uh, Hollow live streams. <laughs> so anyway, back to the question of the experience of learning Japanese. So here's how I learned Japanese. I have such a long history with it. I started learning it from school. In Australia, it's compulsory to learn it um, from primary school. Like you have to pick another language. In my case, I think it was Italian or Japanese. Um, or maybe it was French. But of course, I, I always liked manga as a kid. So I naturally chose Japanese. And in high school, I got absolutely hooked onto anime and vocaloid music. So I continued then too. And then in university, I continued learning it as alongside a teaching degree. University had the most impact on my Japanese abilities, but not in the way you'd expect. It wasn't the classes. It was the fact that there was a Japanese conversation club. And I spent all my time there speaking, uh, you know, just doing a ton of conversation practice. I took classes just to chat in the club room. I went to uni even if I didn't have classes just to join the weekly conversation meetups. Most of the people around me there were far better than me in Japanese. They were either native exchange students or senpais, you know, further in the learning journey than I was at the time. But over time, I quickly got better because I was getting so many reps at speaking. And the other thing was that what university did for me was that I was able to go on a six month exchange to Japan. This is the photo I took from, the, um, from my time there. It's really beautiful. Um, you know, I can't believe how beautiful the place is. It's, it's not like anime because there's no subtitles, but it is like anime in that a lot of things are just so beautiful. The food's great and all that. But anyway, I went on a scholarship program that I actually wasn't qualified for. So the conditions of the program was that you had to have at least JLPT N2, which is the second hardest um, of the JLP tests. And at the time, I hadn't even taken the test before, like I didn't even have N3. But my sensei was like, ah, you'll be fine, Ori, I'll watch for you. So she wrote me a recommendation, and next thing I knew, I was in Japan attending university there, along with some other native Japanese speakers, students. Okay, so like, usually when you go on exchange, you get sent to a university with a Japanese learning program for exchange students. So essentially, there's other English speaking exchange students and sometimes the classes are also in English. But the one I went on was very different. It was attending university classes in Japanese meant for native students. And there were like three other exchange students on campus, but they all had N1 and were really good. So I quickly realized why having N2 was the minimum prerequisite for that. So here I was like some kid for who didn't even have N2 suddenly having to take native level classes and, you know, living in Japan. Um, oh man, don't, you know, like in Japan, when you get to Japan, you know, you have to sign up for a mobile phone contract and all that. I couldn't read a word of the contract. I'm like, what is this? And I think I, if I remember correctly, I had someone from university um, help me with that because I, I couldn't read it. So I'm just, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sign it. I, I, I can't read it. You know, I, I, just, I just need these things. So yeah, it was hectic. And, you know, I, I, I thought I was decent at that point from doing all that conversational practice. But it's like going from being a medium fish in a small pond to a medium fish in an ocean surrounded by whales. And it was funny, actually, because you could pick which classes you wanted to do. And I asked some friends on campus, some Japanese friends on campus for their class recommendations. You know, it's like, what's interesting? And one of them recommended me a law class of some sort. So I took this law class and I don't know if they were trolling me but that was a bad choice because I was like what the hell I don't understand anything like I was like blank in the whole in the whole class the one same grace was that I later found out my grades there didn't matter so much but I still did all the science and tests and you know did as best I could on them and the six months I spent there really accelerated my learning because I was pretty much forced to adapt to the much higher level everyone else was around me if you ever played the game Overwatch, it's like going from Sil Silver League and to being put into Master's League suddenly and simply told to get good. But I, I never gave up and I never stopped learning. I actually really welcomed the fact that everyone was better because that's where I always want to be. Because if everyone is better than me, then I can learn from them all and improve much faster that way. So it was really good for learning and I probably cr managed to cram in like two years worth of improvement in Japanese in those six months. So. 
I also worked as a Japanese tutor while I was in university, and I taught it for a bit at schools too before completely changing directions and deciding to pursue art and doing all the creative stuff I do、um, today. So I've got quite a lot of experience teaching Japanese too, and here are some takeaways from all my years learning and teaching Japanese. So, first, learning textbook Japanese is slow. It's ridiculous, ridiculously slow. Like, I taught, you know, I taught school students, I've taught at a school as well. It's incredibly slow, it's incredibly inefficient. Learning grammar and, learning grammar and sentence structure is necessary. Like, it's, it's not completely useless, it, it's necessary. But the problem is, you've got, to couple it, you've got to couple it in with real life conversation practice as much as possible. When you're doing conversation, you get to train so many skills at the same time. You get to train your speaking, of course. You get to train your listening because you have to listen to the other person, what they're saying. And then you're also recalling all the words because you, you, you can't have your textbook with you, right? You have to have it on the go or fly. You're like recalling, damn, what was that word I learned in class the other day, right? And actually,、um, quick tip here if you want to memorize something, there's a thing called passive and active recall. So, pa passive recall is what school tells us to do. It tells us that we read our, you know, the textbook, read, we take notes, and then we reread our notes before the exam and classes and all that, right? But actually, that's super inefficient. They've done studies on this.、Um, it's also mentioned in the Ultra Learning book that I recommended early on.、Um, what we want to do is what's called active recall, which is that without looking at our notes, without looking at anything, we want to recall it from the top of our head. It's that thing about、um, how we forget. How we forget 50% of what we learn the next day, essentially, right? The way we fight against that is doing recall, but it has to be active recall. It's trying to remember things off the top of our heads. This super applies to drawing as well, because if you think about it, like, if you're studying and you're like, co copying from the reference, you're doing passive recall. What you want to do is put the reference away and see if you can draw what you learned from the reference, or like, if you're doing like, a, a study copy. You want to draw without looking at the reference first. That's active recall. That's su it's, it's super hard and it's, going to, you know, and it's going to feel bad because the drawing is going to turn out really bad because you're, you're going from memory. You can't even see the thing, right? But the moment you do that, you start to see exactly what you remember. Your memory is on paper, essentially, right? And you're like, oh, damn, this is what I remember. And then you check it again with the reference. And then you're like, oh, okay, so now I just have to make these differences, right? This is active recall. This is more efficient than what everyone else. Um, basically, tells us to do. But anyway, so learning textbook Japanese and doing all those passive, passive、um, recall, you know, reading the textbook and all that, it's very, very slow. It's necessary to learn sentence structure and grammar, but you have to couple it with conversation practice. The fastest way to learn Japanese, in my opinion, is that it's to do immersion, aka actually being in Japan coupled with structured study. By the way, this. Will the archive should remain unless、uh, you know, something messes up really badly, but it should remain、uh, in some form. Okay. And if you're a student, so with immersion being the fastest way to learn Japanese, if you're a student, what you want to do is see if you can apply for an exchange program, especially if there's a scholarship available. By the way, everyone in chat,、um, let me know, are you guys a student or are you guys working? Where are you guys at in your life? I'd, I'd love to know so I can kind of make this advice be more、um, tailored towards you. College? Student? Working? Working? Work, working student? Yes, there will be a replay unless、um, our days messes things up. you know. College student? Student graduated high school. There's high schools. Okay, that's interesting. There's middle schoolers. Student, student, student. Oh, I see. Okay, so most people are students. Okay, so if you're a student, that's great because、um, there's usually some sort of scholarship program that you'll be able to apply for. It's a bit tougher when you're an adult because, first of all, adult responsibilities, right?、Um, And, but you can actually, as an adult, what you can do is you can take what's called a working holiday.、Um, and you can learn. So basically, you can see if you can save up some money,、um, go there and work at maybe like an English conversation school or something. And that way, you can kind of live there while still、um, working and earning your keep and all that. 
And for people who've graduated, there's also the th a thing called a JET program, which basically gives you a job in Japan, like a full-time job, full, full paid and all that. And it funds everything for you. It's, it's like the best option. If you've graduated and you've got a degree of some sort, I think that's still the requisite. Um, you can actually take the JET program and then basically work there for a year. And I think you can renew up to five years. So that's like the dream. That's like the best way to do it. But short of going to Japan, like already, you know, like I can't go to Japan. I'm like, you know, you know, I'm, I have to study at the university or like I'm a high schooler or, you know, like I have so many things to do. Short of doing that, see if you can hire a native Japanese tutor to have real conversation practice with. This is really important. I really want to drill down how just how important conversation practice is, because I, I spent like all that time learning at school, you know, in textbook learning and all that. I was good at school at I was good at Japanese at school, but it didn't translate to real life learning. It's that thing about skills being very specific that I talked about before. If you want to learn to draw anime style art, you've got to draw anime style art. If you want to learn how to speak Japanese, you've got to learn to speak Japanese. Skills are super specific, whether we like it or not. It's like, it's just a fact of life at this point. But conversation practice, super important. If you can't hire a Japanese tutor, see if in your local area, if there are any Japanese conversation clubs which you can join. Or, you know, like Japanese communities. It doesn't even have to be conversation clubs. It could be like adjacent. It could be like Japanese culture club. Usually there's a lot of people who are either Japanese or like speaking Japanese. They'll join those things and then you can make great friends with that in, um, in, in those places. And the other one is that you can also make friends online too. I had a friend, uh, I have a friend who plays games in Japanese servers and he became friends with some of the Japanese people he plays with. And that's the way he practices his language. And finally, learning Japanese is a skill unto itself. Just like drawing is a skill, your time is limited. If you want to learn Japanese while learning to draw as well, you might have to give up, you know, some Netflix or some games to have the time. It's it's really skill. It's it might be tough if you're already if you're already working or studying full time, and then you are also trying to learn to draw. On top of that, you're trying to learn Japanese. You might be absolutely overloaded. So you might think, okay, in this phase of my life, I'm going to focus on drawing. Or in this phase of my life, I'm going to focus more on on Japanese. Or in this phase of my life, I'm going to give up Netflix. I'm willing to give up my you know Netflix time to spend um, learning. And by the way, um, the friend I was talking about is in chat. Yep, Fish of Lake. <laughs> He's the one. He, He's really proactive. It's great. Um, it's one of the most creative ways I've seen to learn the language. He, he goes out, joins Japanese servers and makes friends with the people. And he's gotten pretty good at Japanese that way. So take his example. You can actually uh, find speaking buddies online um, through games even. Anyway, um, I hope you found that useful. Are you and less rainy and everyone else in chat that was interested in learning Japanese. And we're going to go that was the last part of the deep dive questions that i had um you know like all writ written out with all the with all the tips and all the learning frameworks and all the you know mental models and whatever that i want to talk about um we're going to go into rapid fire questions but i want to know how did you guys find that let me know in the comments how did you how did you find that and let me know if there was any um further questions on the topics we just covered that you wanted me to to go deeper on before we dive into the rapid fire questions Well presented, it's useful. Glad to hear that. Sounds like a lecture, but that's better than school. Ah, it's my teaching background crawling to the surface. Ah. <laughs> Hopefully over time, it, you know, streaming, streaming is also a skill. I recognize it as a skill. I'm still bringing my, I feel like I'm bringing, because I haven't done streaming before, what I'm doing, I'm substituting teaching into streaming. So, but over time, hopefully I can get better at streaming whatever if I decide to do more in the future, make it more entertaining and all that. But the main thing is, I hope, I hope you guys find it helpful. Because, you know, like, I'm really grateful for you guys, you know, this milestone as well, this celebration stream, it, it's amazing. Like, 100,000 subscribers, I didn't expect it. I fully expected, like, okay, this is going to take 5 to 10 years, whatever. And then, you know, suddenly you guys have bring in amazing support. So, super grateful. And I just want to help a bit more, give back to you guys, you know, see if I can be helpful. But yeah, so... Very fun. Online school all over again. Teaching stream. <laughs> Teaching stream indeed. I love you, videos. Thank you. So we saw detail. Already online schooling. I'll think about it. Gaming stream. Maybe. Any 
any tip for starting YouTube career, faceless YouTuber? Um, first of all, faceless YouTuber isn't, you know, like, I, I'm already thinking, actually, I want to ask you guys, would you guys be more interested if I essentially bought a camera and did more of a real life person, have, have me or, you know, Ori in the videos? Or would you prefer that I have like a VTuber body? I'm actually really interested. What, which would you prefer? Or maybe... Actually, I want to know. I was going to say, like, maybe you don't care. Maybe, you know, both is okay. But uh, in that case, everyone's going to say, oh, yeah, both is okay. Or uh, in that case, that's not an answer. I, uh, so I'd like to know, what, what's your preference, actually? Do, would you, do you prefer VTubers? Do you prefer um, having a real-life face? Because I personally feel that having, you know, that real-life face feels more personal. It's like that human touch. But then again, you know, I love VTubers. You know, I love all the live. And it's, it's what I draw as well. So VTuber body, camera, camera, both is fine, both is fine. VTubers do VTubing, but you do you. Indeed. A lot of people are saying VTuber. You can use both of them. That's a good idea, actually. Yeah, actually, why not both? That meme. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, I'll think about it. Thanks. That's pretty cool. Yeah, face reveal. Yeah, I, I don't mind going on camera. It's like, I just don't have a camera is a problem. And the room, the room I draw in and where all my computers is, is super, super messy. So it's like, I, I can't stream. It's like, it's like, <laughs> now I can see for our days we hear thanks fishy <laughs> maybe switch on certain VTubers or games okay that's interesting so is it actually like when playing games people prefer VTubers but when talking more of like you know like these human kind of human experiences you prefer a real person is, is that what it is I'd love to know what you guys think Can mix real life VTuber with models. I think VTuber fits well. We come from rig rigging process. It's normal for artists to have messy room. Indeed, artists have messy rooms. Really? Yeah, something like that. Okay, that's yeah, that's very interesting. Okay, I'll think about it. Thanks a lot. Yep. Okay, sweet. Let's go on to the rapid fire questions. These ones I don't really have scripted, so I'll probably come up. You know, I have I have a few notes, but uh. I'll say some things, I'll read, you know, if people want to chime in in the comments as well, I'll see if there's anything interesting to go on to riff off and we'll go from there. So, Dishwasher and Spring Cash has the first of the rapid fire questions. Congratulations, Ari. Where and how do you actually, how do you usually look for reference and how do you make the most out of it? And congrats, or congrats on reaching 100k subs. I wanted to thank you for helping me get a proper guide on how to practice my drawing skills because I struggled finding good reference material for the style I wanted. And my question is, what are your inspirations and ref of references? Thanks for, um, thanks Dishwasher and Spring Cash. Um, so references, mm, when it comes to illustration references, I mainly just go from Twitter. So basically just from the Twitter feed, I kind of like, you know, see the art, whatever it pops up. If I like it, I'll like it, save it on Twitter, or maybe I'll save it in a, it's actually a really good tip to create a reference folder of all the art you find appealing and kind of save me art there. Pinterest, yeah. So for photo references, I like to use Pinterest and Unsplash. Um, Unsplash, super amazing. Pinterest is a bit tricky because you don't know, you know, like if you can use it for, um, if it's for practice, it's probably okay, but you don't know if you can use it to create an illustration because of all the copyright stuff, right? But Unsplash is the royalty, um, it's all free, so copyright free. So it makes it one of the best, uh, I find it's like such a good reference site to use. Oh, Pixiv? I don't actually search Pixiv for art. I mainly get it from Twitter. Um, but I know, like, if you like Pixiv, use Pixiv. Um, the main thing is to use what to use what you already use, right? It, it comes back to the point of that we're all unique. We're all unique. We're all different. Um, you're gonna if you're trying to copy someone else, you can only ever be the second best of that person. But if you're fully unique yourself, then you know no one can compete with you at being you. Essentially, that doesn't mean we don't learn. Try to learn from people who are ahead of us. You know, like or you know who spent longer learning and all that. Of course, we have to learn. We have to also understand what makes popular things popular so we can bring it into our own art. But it also means that we can also lean into the things that we think make us unique while also trying to cater to an audience. I saw it. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so I think I think that's it for this question. So let's go to the next one. Oh, 
I'm Firsty. Congratulations, Ari. Thank you for making so much quality content. It really does help a lot. I have a question. What is your first drawing tablet and what is your experience on it? Okay, so my first tablet was a crappy tablet that came for free with the computer. It didn't even have a brand name on it. I think it was called something like Windows Vista graphics tablet. It was really, really bad compared to even the cheapest of tablets today. Like it was so terrible. It was tiny. It the pen pressure probably had like 100 doubles. <laughs> it's like you think you think it's like, you know, like the, the pen pressure today these days is like 8,000, 16K. Like try drawing with one that's like 100. It's it's like freaking drawing with a mouse on a tablet. Oh, man. Tablets back then was terrible. Um, this kind of begs the question. What uh, I think people are gonna ask, like, okay, um, so what what do you recommend? What do you recommend, right? Um, I think just get these days. Even the cheap tablets are pretty good. I think just go along with your budget. It's okay if you want to invest. Like the higher end tablets, the more expensive ones, they come with nice little perks, nice little quality of life stuff. It's it's pretty nice, but it's not necessary. If you just want to draw, you can get by with like a cheap tablet. So I don't want to force like you know like the students out there who who you know. Tablets can get expensive, but tablets can also be cheap. I think if you're just trying to get art into art as a hobby, but <clears throat> I think there was another question further on where I talk about the kind of tablet. Let me skip to it. I didn't have this in order. Um, this one was from Jin. Hey Ori, love your art. What kind of tablet to use when drawing? So going off on that, the tablets topic, what I currently use is a display tablet, but I used a flat tablet for a very long time. So, um, People who's been on the, with this channel watching my videos um, since the start would know this, but uh, I once talked about how I had my Wacom Cintiq, my 16 inch, the old one, not the new one, <clears throat> but the old uh, Wacom Cintiq. And I used it flat on the desk, like a flat tablet, because using it as a display tablet absolutely killed my shoulder. It was so painful to draw in that position. Like, I don't know how people do it, but it was so bad for my posture and all that. Like, I couldn't do it, so I had to do it flat. On, on the tablet, um, on the desk. So I ended up using a flat tablet for a long time, but recently I got back into using a display tablet. Um, and I don't know. I found it, maybe it's because I was using the flat tablet for like five years that switching up to a display tablet became more fun to draw with. Maybe there's a thing about the hand connection thing where you can actually see what you're drawing at. And, but, to be honest, when it comes to results and all that, I think it actually doesn't matter what you use. Um, if you if it's more fun, if it's more fun to draw with a display tablet, then use a display tablet. But functionally speaking, both are absolutely fine. Like I, I know people who use either one; they're both great. And let's talk about like the downsides and upsides of display tablet, right? So the downside of a display tablet is it's definitely more expensive. It's like quadruple the price, I think. Um, and it's not as ergonomic. Um, and the upside is that you have a beautiful screen, you can see what you're drawing, etc. It's probably easier if you're going from a traditional drawing. If you're used to drawing uh, pencil paper, you're going to go into a display tablet and like, oh, this feels natural. I have a pen in my hand and I draw on the screen. But if you use a flat tablet, you're trying to reconnect, you're trying to build up your eye-hand coordination in a slightly different way. So there's a bit of a learning curve. So there is um, what you're, you're getting is a learning curve, right? But um, it's cheaper. So those are the trade-offs. And yeah, if you if you have um, if you have stiff shoulders, better. I had to actually write down a tip for this one. If you have a, t a stiff shoulder from drawing or like bad posture, there's actually a really good hack that I recommend. I wish I knew this earlier. It's to buy one of those small circle massage bowls. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it um, in those sports stores. Have you ever seen like those small circle massage bowls? Those are so amazing. Like, um, so what you do with those is that you put them, you put it like against the wall or a door and then you can massage the back of your shoulder and all that. So you don't, so it's like one, one of the solutions is to go to like a massage parlor and get one of those nice massages and have someone, you know, like a monsieur treat your shoulders and it feels amazing and all that. But I don't think, I think most of us don't have that much cash to burn and it also takes time. So my, what I found is that getting the small massage balls does the same thing, which is that it just loosens up all the tightness and the sniffness is in your shoulders. And that's been like a massive hack for me that I found out only recently since last year. That's because I was, I was getting so much shoulder pain from drawing so much that 
I'm like, uh, there has to be a way. I was con considering first to, you know, go to like a monsieur, but I actually happened upon one of those massage balls and it's just changed my life. So um, I think you can just Google massage ball. Um, I think if you just Google massage ball, it'll come up. It's it's literally one of those small massage, uh, you know, a small ball. They're cheap. Yeah, I think you can get it for like $5 or something. And it, it's an absolute game changer if you draw for a long time and you get stuff shoulders like, oh, so good. And... There's also like those foam rollers. The other one is the foam rollers that that has helped with back with back stiffness. So the massage ball helps with the shoulder stiffness. But if you get a foam roller, it's kind of like this tube thing with like um, these foam spikes that act almost like a massage thing thing as well. But you can roll it at the top, um, basically around you know um, your trapezius. If if you've done your anatomy studies, you'll understand. But it's like the top of your back and kind of the sides of your back, not on your spine. Don't, don't ever use it on your spine. But yeah, those, those kind of really help with like the with with the stiffness in the back. Okay. Um, I think at the t at the speed we're going, we might have time for um, Q and A at the end. Maybe I'll pick up some of the because there's a lot of people commenting questions. I might do that at the end. So we'll get through these rapid fire questions, and if there's um, time left over, um, let's see if I can pick up some um, questions from the comments. Okay. So next question. Uh, oh yeah, we can do this one. Artists, have you tried other softwares for drawing your illustrations, such as uh, Krita, I think this person means, um, or Ivy's Paint? Thanks for the question, account. Um, so I've only used, what have I used? I've used Clip Studio. I've used Photoshop. I've used Procreate on the iPad. I think for painting software, it's those three. And for, um, you know, like there's other software I've used for uh, for illustrations such as, you know, Blender, um, you know, all the 3D stuff as well. Uh, but when it comes to illustration, I use Clip Studio and Photoshop. Out of, oh, and Procreate, but I don't really draw on the iPad. I only do that when I go traveling or I need to do something on the go. So what I found out of all those is that Clip Studio is the best suited for, um, for essentially what I need for drawing anime style art, I didn't need all the fancy stuff in Photoshop. Like Photoshop is weirdly complex. It lets you do everything and it does it amazingly well. It's like, you know, you can exchange, you can alter every tiny little color gradient curve, every little part of your painting. It's amazing for that. Clip Studio can't do that. But I don't think you really need to do that on that for, uh, I guess everyone's a bit different. Like I can't say everyone because everyone, you know, every art, Every artist is a bit different in what art they do. So I think the way you do it is try out your software. If it, if you find it works for what you need, perfect. You don't really need to do something else. I know a lot of people use Ibis Paint nowadays. I personally haven't really gone into it, but I think that's perfect, perfectly fine. If it suits your needs, perfectly fine. Um, as for, but I, for what I can speak for is Photoshop versus Clip Studio. Clip Studio has this amazing asset store that you can just find materials for your drawing and it's very related to anime art because you know you can find your brushes um you can find photo textures you can find 3d models poses and all that it just makes it really convenient that it's like okay clip studio is just a bit more convenient it's less laggy than photoshop for me i have like a potato pc i think at this state um yeah it's definitely potato pcs by modern standards um but clip studio is a bit easier on my poor pc um <laughs> photoshop lags so much and it crashed also i, I felt like Clip Studio does crash sometimes, but Photoshop crashes even more on my potato PC, so... Uh, Clip Studio, save me. But yeah, anyway, Clip Studio, I think if you find Krita or Ibis Paint, fine, use it. That's great. If you draw on the iPad, great. That works as well. Like, I know a lot of people use iPads uh, to draw on. iPads are great to draw on. Um, or, I don't know, like, I don't know if Android tablets are a thing, but you could probably use those as well. But yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, and the time-lapse function on Clip Studio is, is really good. It's um it's amazing. Like uh, with the new update, it's really small files as well. So I can recommend it for the time lapse function, which I don't think Photoshop has yet. So that's a, that's another one. That's a great um that's a great point there. Okay, let's go to the next question. Furo says, Furo asks, how do you draw your backgrounds? Okay, so backgrounds um. Kind of similar to characters, actually. I sketch it out, and then I just, you know, rough out the color, uh, put on colors, rough it out. Um, I used to draw, I used to use 3D and all that, but these days I've just been drawing them by hand. It's 
like. So let, let me think back to what might be more helpful to um, to the people listening here when it comes to backgrounds. So if it's your first time drawing backgrounds, you're probably you probably have a ton of questions. Like you you've, you've probably been going through these fundamentals, right? And you're like perspective. P-E-R-S-P-E-C-T-I-V-E. -E. I hope I spelled that right. Um, what is this? What do I do? Oh my god, like, how do I put the freaking human thingy on the line thingy? And then, um, you know, angle, low angle, uh, horizon line, vision, whatever. Right? You're like, oh my god, per perspective. Um, yes. Okay. So I, I I went through that phase. The first time I drew backgrounds, it was it was terrible. It was so bad. Like, I, I first started, like, I had... Clip Studio has these perspective rulers. I tried to make it exactly like mathematically correct. Uh, pro tip Ori, uh, pro tip from Ori here, um, art is not maths. <laughs> you don't need to make everything like mathematically correct. Like no, no one's, no one's judging you. No one's judging you if you're, if you're mathematically incorrect. <laughs> like no, no one really cares. Right? Uh, everyone's looking at your, uh, at your art for like one second before they scroll on to the next thing on um, Twitter, TikTok, whatever, Instagram, X, um, etc. Right? So. Don't bother too much about that. Um, but it is helpful to know. That doesn't mean you can throw perspective out the window. If you don't, if you throw perspective out the window, it's like your people are in space. Not even space. They're not even in the same 3D plane. They're like, it's like the metaverse, right? It's like, you know, like metaverse, whatever. You're like in different dimensions, right? If you don't have perspective, they're all in different dimensions with different camera angles. And it's like people floating around. It's like, what is this? People, the honest one get it. You do need to know perspective, but you don't need to be mathematical in its application. Like that. So it's important to know. Yes, you do need to go through um, the phase of like, how do I draw a box in perspective, rotate around, you know, correctly in angles. That will help you draw many, many things. That will help you draw many, many things correctly in perspective because you can translate that box to the head, you can translate that box to the human body, you can translate that box to anything you're drawing. Anime girls, anime dudes, you know, husbandos, waifus. That is important. But if you're doing if you're doing character art specifically, so anime character illustration art, the pers um, the background's usually not such a big deal. You can actually get it get away with just like making it look like it, making it look kind of correct. Like it doesn't have to be so um, so perfectly correct. But um, it does take practice to know how to create that kind of illusion where it looks correct, but it's probably not correct, but it looks great, right? So it does take practice to do it. And you, it's okay to start off with trying to do the perspective lines. You're probably gonna start off with doing kind of boring backgrounds. Um, I don't know if this is helpful, but you might want to try so I did a lot of 3D, if you watched my latest video, um, you'll probably know that I did a lot of 3D um, experimentation. You know, I did, I did Blender, I used Clip Studio 3D, I tried a lot of things with 3D, mainly for the background as well. So it kind of helped, I felt that that helped me get a sense of 3D space really well. Because when I was using 3D, right, I would pose the 3D figure into this 3D space in the background and then I'd render the camera shot, right? And then it kind of, over time, because I did that a lot, I'm like, okay, yeah, so generally this is what it should look like with this camera angle and all that. So maybe playing around with 3D might actually be helpful if you're into that. That, that can help. So playing around with 3D might be a tip for you helping, you know, getting a sense of how to draw a background. Because the process for rendering the background is pretty much the same as the character. You you draw the sketch, you draw the rough, you know, rough it out with colors, and then you render it nice, make it neat and all that. So it's not that much difference. But then the, um, I think the most, the actual question people have when they're starting out is like, I'm scared of perspective. I don't know how perspective works. Um, I don't know how to match it into the camera uh, with the with the character, right? I can draw the, I can draw the human figure. I can draw the anime character, you know, the, the face, the upper torso, whatever. And I can draw that well, but the moment I draw the background, it doesn't work. That is a pers that is probably a perspective problem, like thinking of how does the character fit into the scene cor um, correctly in perspective. It doesn't have to be mathematically correct. Again, it just has to kind of match what the horizon line and all that is. So that just takes practice. Yes, you do. Fundamentals will help with that, but then you also want to apply it as much as you can. So you. you so I think the best tip I can do, um, I can give for that one is that when you're drawing your characters, start by adding a horizon line when you're drawing, right? You draw, you open up, um, when you're drawing a piece, you, you draw the horizon line and 
this doesn't even have to be full illustration. This can be a practice sketch. You draw a horizon line. It can be in the middle. It can be the bottom. It can be up. You know, if it's in if it's in the middle, it's kind of like straight on view. If it's in the bottom, towards the bottom, then what you're doing is you're looking at it from below. And if it's from above, then you're looking at it from above, right? And then what you do is maybe it's too hard to draw a character if you're just starting out. Just draw a box. Imagine that this box is my character. This box is my character, and then draw that box correctly along that horizon line, right? So if it's flat on, it's a flat on box. If it's from above, then you're looking at the box, box from above. And if it's from below, you're looking at the box from below. And then you now you have a sense, okay, this is what the box looks like in perspective. What if I try, try to translate that into, you know, the human face, the human head or the human body, right? And then change that. And then suddenly you're able to draw crackling perspective. And then, okay, if I can start to draw the character crackling perspective, um, what if I start adding another box at the back and this can be a chair? This can be a wall. This can be, yeah, it's like Minecraft. Exactly, right? This can be the box for like a car or whatever, right? It's actually very helpful. I've done that practice before, actually. Um, no, I found that actually very helpful. So it's like everything into boxes and then translate those boxes into the more complex shape. So then you start, okay, if I can draw this human box correctly in perspective, what if I just add another box behind it correctly in perspective and I translate that into the chair and now I have a background? Yep. I think I think if you just do that practice, you'll eventually get the thing. And of course, later on, as you get your sense of perspective and how to do it, because it doesn't have to be mathematically correct, remember? It just has to kind of look it just kind of has to kind of look right. So over time, what you'll do is you get you'll build up that sense of okay, this looks right. And you know, you can also be, be sneaky it's like, I know this is not right, but it looks great and I can probably get away with it. People aren't gonna see anything wrong because there's they're not paying too much attention and all that. So you can actually get away with that. Um but how you learn it, I think that might help. So Start with boxes, draw boxes in perspective. Don't even try to draw characters in perspective. Just draw boxes first. And then see if you can draw one box in perspective, that's your character. If you can draw another box behind it, that's another object. And eventually, if you populate that with more boxes, you can get a background. And then you just kind of chip away at the boxes and make your chair, table, whatever you need. OK. Next question. Um, wait, we've done that question. Next one. You ask, I'm currently in online college, so I have to dedicate three to four hours per day, 15 to 20 hours per week since it's difficult. How many hours per how many hours per week would you recommend me to study for a training arc? Then just regular studying after I've got some solid understanding of the basics. How many people here? Um, I don't know. I think I had a, quite a bit of questions about like practice hours. Um, let me know chat. Um, let me know everyone in chat. Like how many hours do you draw a week how many hours do you get to draw a week and all that uh, how many hours can you spend drawing in a week i'd love to know let me know seven one hour less hours today yeah, in, in a week or maybe in a day. If you if you draw daily, that's also fine. Like, how many hours do you usually get to draw? 20 hours a week, 10 to 10, 10 to 20, 5 to 15 minutes a day. So that's, yeah, you get about a few hours a week. Seven-ish hours. Okay. Okay, okay. I see. Everyone gets a few hours. Generally, everyone gets a few to several hours a week in. Yep. About 25 a week? Yeah. If, you, if you're a student, you can probably get more um, hours in. That's great. Like, one of the best things with the students is you get a lot of free time. You can spend that on drawing. Or you can spend it on uh, other hobbies. Like, it's drawing is a skill that you can learn any... It's not like sport where you, you're you primed to do the activity while you're still young and your body is fit, right? It's not like basketball or football um, where there is an advantage to being young and being primed to learn that skill early on. But drawing is, is a skill you can learn any time in your life. So you can actually pick it up later in life. Um, I think there was some science where it's like people, younger people learn things faster, but I feel you can still learn it nonetheless, right? Um, at any stage in life, relatively well. It's not one of these things that um, you get penalized too heavily. Although, I, I don't know, maybe when you're young, uh, you know, really young kids, they they pick up things really fast. So maybe there's, there's something to that, but Overall, I feel like drawing you can pick up anytime, so you don't need to feel bad. So if you're like in this phase of your life where you're like, I need to learn these other things, you know, I can't spend that much drawing time now, but I can do it later. Or maybe you can spend a lot of time now and then you'll do the other things later. That's also fine. Okay, but anyway, um, since we're quite split on people who draw a few hours a day to people who draw several hours a week, you know, many hours a week, like 20 hours per week, that's pretty good. That's like 
almost like a part-time job, um, part-time work. So we're into these camps of people who want to draw as a hobby and people who are quite serious about drawing as an art. And it's like, I want to make this a commercial thing, you know, right? I want to, I don't, I want to see if I can make this into something I can do for work. So first of all, if it's just a hobby, dude, like maximize for fun. Don't, don't stress about it. Like a hobby, do what, what is going to make it fun. Do what's going to make it um, feel enjoyable to do. It's, it's like, um, you know, like I, I, it's like playing games. It's like, I don't, I personally don't try to become an esports player, but I enjoy playing games because I like playing games, you know? It's, uh, so I maximize for fun when I'm playing games. And so if drawing is something you just enjoy, just maximize for fun. If, if that's drawing a few hours a day, a few hours um, here and there, go for that. It, it becomes a bit different when you want to do it for a commercial aspect. Because then um, you do have to reach a certain level of skill for people to be okay um, essentially commissioning you, right? Because it comes back to that thing where it's like, um, you're kind of, it's, you're, you're kind of have to, the amount of, the skill level you need to do is also based on what other commercial people doing the commercial work, their skill, what their skill levels are, right? It's like the thing I talked about with the 10,000 hours, right? The 10,000 hours thing is, is not the right number because it's going to depend on the field and how many practice hours other people in the field have accumulated as well. So then what you're doing is like, okay, people who, who are able to do commercial work, what's the number of practice hours they've done? I need to match that at least, right? Because when it comes to commercial work, yes, there is kind of a market. Um, there's also, you know, the personal art aspect to it. So it's not, compl you know, it's not, it's not, it's a weird paradox where it's like, it's a competition, but it's not a competition. Like everyone's is in this field called art, illustration, commissions, um, whatever, right? Creating, creating, YouTube, even streaming, but everyone then has their own niche. So you're like, at one side, you're in this big bubble. You're in this big bubble called art. But within that bubble, you're in tiny, small, we're all in small, tiny bubbles called niches. Where it's like, I am the person who draws Laplace fan art. I am the person who draws, um, I, I don't know, Jujutsu Kaisen fan art. I draw, you know, um, <laughs> I only draw those characters or whatever, right? I draw Chainsaw Man fan art. I am that person. You know, that's my niche. Or I, I draw cat, cat ear girls, whatever, right? Uh, we're all in these different niches, so in a sense, we're in we're competing in the whole art bubble. But then we're in our own specific niches, and if we're kind of unique enough in that one, we're not we're not really competing against anything. So there is a certain, but there is still a certain level I think you need to reach. So when you're when it comes, so going back to practice hours things, right? If it's a, if it's just a hobby, just maximize for fun. Just do what is enjoyable for you. See if you can. Um, I do recommend practicing a lot, though. I have to add in that a game is more fun when we're good at it, right? It's like, dude, it feels great to be amazing in a game. It feels great to go from finally earning, you know, going from silver to to diamond, diamond to masters. It feels great to mastery. Mastery feels great. There's actually like the three fundamental human needs for um, for learning something or like fulfillment i think it's the fancy term i think it's like self-determination theory it's that we humans need to have um we, we humans want competency we want autonomy and we want related to this competency is mastery we want to be good at things autonomy means that we want to have choices we want to choose what we can do and relatedness means we want to feel like our work matters our work matters to us our work matters to others right now if you hit the competency, if you if you get good at the thing, you'll often get the other two, which is that if you're really good, you can do whatever you want and people will, you know, like you are or whatever. So I do recommend that it's good to put in more practice hours because the better you get at drawing, the more fun drawing gets and you become in this positive feedback loop where it's just so fun to draw because you're getting good at it. People are cheery. Uh, people are like giving you feedback that it's like, hey, your art's getting better. You're, you're doing great work. You're putting the hours in, you do, you're making progress and you're like, yeah. I can do this. And then your hobby becomes even more fun and it becomes really fulfilling. So I do recommend even as a hobby, but but if that's not you, like if you just want to maximize for fun, absolutely maximize for fun. 
don't you don't don't try to turn your hobby you don't have to turn your hobby into a career that's that's not what we always want to do um, but if you're maximizing for I want to make this commercial work then you do want to max out those uh, practice hours and it does also mean that so the question is how many hours per week would you recommend me to study for a training arc and then just regularly studying after I've got some solid basic um, understanding of the basics if you're doing this commercially you want to maximize training hours as much as you can um, you know like as much as you can and what training arts for is for dealing with your specific bottlenecks and if you're just starting out everything is a bottleneck in that case focus on the character drawing assuming you want to draw character illustrations because that's the main thing in anime art anime art is anime art because of the anime characters if you're into the ghibli style uh, background art then that's a bit different you probably want to go into background art right but um focus all your hours dealing with your bottlenecks essentially because that's the most efficient way to learn. Right? If you're if you struggle with drawing the face, then you need to practice drawing the face. It's not, like let's say you're good at everything else but you've never you're not really good at anatomy. If you keep practicing your lighting, shading, coloring, but you keep ignoring that one bottleneck, it's going to haunt you forever. It's going to drag down all the it's going to drag down the overall quality of your art because there's just that one thing that stands out. It's like, it's like, it's like a car. You have the wheel, you have the engine, you have like the case, right? If you're missing a wheel, one wheel, there's no point in you upgrading the engine to like a, a million dollar engine, upgrading the, the, the car chassis to, uh, to something really expensive and fancy, right? Because you're, you're missing that damn wheel, man, right? You need to get that wheel in, put the wheel in. It, there's no point in you upgrading everything else. Put, put that wheel in, right? Because you, you're missing that one wheel and it's making your car you, like s unable to drive correctly. So how many hours per week would you study for a training arc? Put all of those hours in, into your training arc to focus on the model neck. Just keep on focusing it. Um, yeah, I think I hope I answered that question correctly. And let's go to the next one. There's some um, there's some amazing artists who draw entirely with their feet. Amazing. <laughs> That's beyond comprehension for me. Yeah, I relate so much. Um, Toku H says, I relate so much. My anatomy is my bottleneck. I feel you. Like I feel a lot of people have anatomy and figure drawing is the bottleneck. And it, because it's like one of those things that it's like the hardest tree to cut down. Like because the human figure is so complex. One, it's complex. Two is that as humans, we see it every day and we're really attuned to other humans, right? Because uh, if we go back in like history, like it's so important to observe other people. We need to know if they're friend um, friendly or might be potential dangers to us. Um, we want to know what their intentions are. We, um, you know, we want to know what kind of person they are. So we're so attuned to humans and we can detect like micro expressions in their faces and all that, which means that to draw a convincing human face, it takes a lot of work because we have to deal with the fact that we see humans every day and we're really tuned to how it looks. So that's the hardest tree to chop down. But if you keep hacking away, you know, chopping out that tree, chopping out that tree, you will get better. Okay, sorry, I've already answered this question. Bakasavi says, Hi there, Happy New Year's. I have just a small question. I've been sketching for 30 minutes, mostly every day for two months. Does that count towards experience gain or am I just wasting time? I mean, nothing's wasted. Everything counts. If you're... Every, Everything, I really feel, I really believe from the depths of my heart that everything counts. You don't waste anything. If you can only put in 15 minutes here and every day because you're so busy with your work, you know, you have classes and then you work part times and then you come back, you're like, oh, damn, I'm really tired, but I'm going to put in 15, 30 minutes to sketch, um, to put in that sketch. It counts. It'll build up. Like, I, I talk in my videos like um, that I really focused on art in 2018 and I did only... Um, I focused on illustration in 2018 and I really focused on illustration in 2018. But I did sketch during high school. I sketched during classes because, man, they were really boring. And I was always wondering, like, am I ever going to use this? The answer is no, I, I, I never really used it. <laughs> uh, I was right. And so it was good time. I, I spent good time sketching away. And I feel like that added up. And yes, it's not as efficient um, as if you can put in a lot of time straight away and then just, you know, spending focused effort. A long time focus as effort in like a small short amount of time like if you do three months focus every day drawing for eight hours every day you improve so much faster than trying to spread that over five years that's just a fact of how the human brain works um 
but it does count. It carries over. You absolutely don't lose it. And on this topic, I, I want to add that you don't, you also don't lose the skills you learn in other areas of your life. I, I really want to hone this in because it, it, it's really important because um, I feel like a lot of people also start kind of late. Um, you know, the people in, in the chat here, um, when we asked, like, a lot of people were, uh, you know, like in uni, college, wherever, or are already working and they're like starting a bit late. If, so, first of all, if you're young, your advantage is that you have all this time to spend on learning drawing. You have all the time, you can start early, you can um, put in every amount of time you have into drawing and you'll improve really fast. If you're if you start late, you have more responsibilities. Maybe you're a student working, um, studying for a degree. Maybe you're in college, and you only have like your part time. You're right. You, you have to do this, and then you have your time on the side to draw. Um, and if you're working as an adult, you also have very limited time. But the thing is, right? The older you get, the more skills you have already picked up. The other skills you've learned. So you, what you want to do is like combine the other skills you've picked up in your life and fit that into like the art that you want to do in a sense in a sense um i'll use myself as an example like i had in a sense this youtube channel i feel i feel i don't know i can't say for sure but i feel like this um the reason a lot of people um thankfully watch my videos i'm very grateful for that and a lot of people find it useful is because i spent seven years teaching uh, and like breaking down information, right? It wasn't drawing, of course, like I was teaching Japanese, but I, I obsessed over how could I teach this? How can I teach Japanese in the most efficient way possible so that the people um, that hire me or, or my students, you know, my students, they can understand it. Because I, was I, I taught from kindergartens all the way to adults. I had to teach the same thing to both things. So I had to make sure that even kindergartens, like even really young people can understand and learn something from it, right? So I had to figure out how, to, how do I make this in the most simple way possible? And I feel like that skill carried over to um, the YouTube channel. So I feel like you, you always carry over the skills from other things and you kind of find a way to put it into the things that you do. So it's like, if you only do, if you only, if all you do is, if all, all your, all you're competing on is like illustration art, then you're competing against all the other people who've gone all in on illustration, right? And then that becomes of who, who has the most practice hours, who has the most hours spent practicing the skill and getting good at it, right? And the people who've already spent, who started 20 years ago, who had 20,000 20, hours in, is always gonna be ahead. But what happens is there's this thing called skill stacking, which is that you stack skills. So you might not be the best in the world at drawing you might not be the best at in you know entertaining people or streaming you might not be the best at speaking i don't know speaking japanese or whatever right but the combination of all three together can make you into like a very unique streamer and then you have like um you know Kason, um Kason, the vtuber slash youtuber right um who does all three Right, um, she's ex. She might not be the best person at Japanese, but um, I don't know. I can't say. I'm not. I, I don't know her content too well, so I can't really say. But the point I'm trying to say uh, to put in is that you can't stack skills. You might not be the best at all of it, but the combination of it makes you unique in some way. Right. Um, so skills definitely carries over. You don't waste anything. Everything counts. And yeah, I hope you find that useful. Let's go to the next question. It's a bit different than jack of all trades. A jack of all trades tries to be equally good at many, many things. What you want to do is like focus on two or three things. So it's like if you if you can if you can juggle very well, and if you can make entertaining YouTube videos, and you know how to video edit, you'll become like a very you'll become a, very, a great YouTuber essentially, right? a great entertaining juggler youtuber and then you might go on into ma doing magic on youtube whatever right it it's that kind of thing it's not it's not a jack of all trades where you're like i'm good at so many things but specifically good at none of them this is more like you're specifically good at two or three things and if you're older in life it's like i've picked up two or three skills i picked up along the way in my life um and i'm going to add this third skill and i'm going to combine it in a way that's unique and authentic to myself yeah, I hope I hope that makes sense and I hope you're finding that helpful. So next question. 
Do you think do you think learning grayscale before colors is useful or should one just dive into colors straight away? I've um, I see a lot of artists painting in grayscale then using gradient maps color. So I can't really comment on gradient maps since I don't use them that much. I did try to use them earlier on, but I never really found a use. Like recently I've tried it to use it to add colors in like the end of my art, but it doesn't really match the kind of art I make. So I can't really comment on gradient maps too much, but if it's, um, is learning grayscale useful? If the goal is to draw a color illustration, then just dive into color, color straight away. Remember, skills are direct and you want to do as much direct practice as possible. That said, grace, what grayscale practice can help you is learn values and value control. It depends what... So if you're having trouble, right, like um, values are so important in that it creates the structure of the piece, right? It's like um, colors in a sense is a later addition to values. You need to have your value structure in place, right? You know, like this is dark, this is light and all that. Um, it, it's super important, but I think you can learn if you just learn grayscale without applying it to color, you'll never learn how to apply it to color. But learning grayscale does help you give value control. So then you're like, okay, um, I want the foregrounds to be dark. I want the, the midground to be medium and I want the backgrounds to be very light, right? And then have that um, value structure in my painting. And then when you go to paint in color, because you've practiced that, you've practiced like separating things into grayscale and studying um, other art. So you can study like other pieces by artists, put it into grayscale and see how they structure their values. Like you might see, you might find exactly that. The, the foreground is dark, the media, the midground or the character is medium. And then the background is very light. And you're like, ah, I see. So when I do my own colors in my paintings, I'm going to try to go do that same value structure. And then you, you put on your colors and then you check it, you turn your piece into black and white and then check it. And you're like, ah, damn, everything in my painting is gray. Everything's mid-tone. This was a problem I had. Everything was mid-tone. Damn, like no wonder people can't tell what's in the foreground and background. Everything's like the same value. So it can help you in that way. So learning grade skills is useful, but you want to do as much color practice as possible. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Should you check your colors? Um, Yamanaka asks, should you check your colors grayscale when you, while you color them? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, I'm not sure how many people do it, but um, I, I, I do that. I do that from time to time when I'm painting a piece. I put it into black and white just to make sure the values are correct, that the shadows are dark enough, that I'm not conflicting how dark the background is. So like, I don't want the background to be as dark as my characters because not, it won't look like the background. It'll look like they're in the exact same plane in the illustration, right? So I want to push it back. I'll make it a bit lighter, depending on the painting, of course. But yeah, like that. Okay. Asudim says, I wish I was taking notes throughout the live stream. So many jumping writers. This stream um, should be archived, so you can always replay it if you need to. Unless I mess up, then buy archive. Okay. Herman Maula asks, congratulations for reaching 100k subs, thank you. My question is, if x equals 3 and y equals 6, then what do you think of pizza topped with pineapple? Uh, 4. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I don't mind it. It's, it's, it's pretty good. By the way, people think pineapple pizza divides people, but anyone who's familiar with the durian fruit would know that that's a real dividing line. It's either like the best tasting thing ever or the equivalent of nuclear waste. Anyway, next question. Odinus um, asks, congrats, how long have you been drawing seriously? And how much frequently do you draw? I'm making these questions because your progress has been astonishing. So I mentioned this before, but I started, um, I started taking illustration seriously around 2018. And since then, I pretty much spent every available moment I had um, essentially living and breathing illustration and drawing and figuring out how to imp uh, improve. Like, I gave up, like, because I, so I, I, I mentioned before that I did, I went to university, I did a teaching degree and I worked at a school for a bit and then I changed directions to art, right? Yeah, so I basically, I basically, I was really depressed because I, when I was in university, right, when I did the teaching degree, I never really wanted to do that. 
I always knew I wanted to draw. I wanted to do something with art. That was that was like that was like in me. But basically, you know, like everyone around me, parents and you know, all that, you know, the usual stuff. I think everyone has that where it's like you want to do art, and then everyone around you is like, "Oh my God, are you out of your mind? Are you you're, you're doing art? No, 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 no. You, you, my friend, you're 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 gonna be you're gonna be uh, insert doctor, engineer, lawyer, uh, accountant, uh, whatever your parents want. <laughs> you know, whatever hopes and dreams your parents have for you. Um, but anyway, um. That was a bad choice for me because I became really depressed. Like I was not happy with my life. I was very unhappy where where I was. Um, you know, I, I just was un, unhappy with anything. I did great in university. I was a great student. Typical Asian environment, exactly. Um, but it's not only Asians. Um, I know a lot of, you know, a lot of people from every background, every race. Everyone. It, I think it's a universal thing where we all kind of face this problem. So I don't think it's not, it's just limited to um, Asians or whatnot or types of people. But anyway, like I, I was really unhappy. I, I was very depressed. I started hating everything. I started hating my life. You know, it's just like, it's like, it was to the point where it, it made me feel ill to just, you know, like talk with people. Like I was that unhappy in my life. Like everything like, seemed so big, right? So then I decided, you know, there's this weird thing there's this weird thing I learned the other day where it's like you you usually only can take the jump once your situation is bad enough. I hope I, I hope this makes sense. It's like if your life is kind of okay, you're cruising along, it's kind of sucks, it's kind of bad, but it's not bad enough that you take the jump because taking a jump is even is even more painful. It's even worse than your life right now, right? So it's like, oh man, I really want to do art. I really want to take a jump. I want to become a streamer. I want to become an esports player. I want to become whatever, right? I want to do whatever you want, right? Make games. But, and it, it really sucks. I'm really happy, unhappy with I am right now, but it's going to be more painful for me to make take that jump. So I won't do it. That's that's like this weird zone where you're uncomfortable, but not, not comfortable enough to make the jump. That's like the worst place to be because you're like in this perpetual state of like uncomfortableness. In my case, I became so bad. It became so painful to just be where I am, which was being a teacher. I, and I was a great student. I, I did great. I did whatever people told me I was meant to do. I did got good grades. I got you know scholarship. I got um, I got um, employed before I graduated. Whatever. And I was completely unhappy. I was so unhappy. I was so depressed. And that it was so painful that it just became easy to jump because at this point, like my my existence is miserable. I'm gonna do, I'm just, I have to try something else. So then I did. So then I tried finding art. Um, I didn't find drawing straight away. Like I haven't mentioned this in my videos, but I thought, um, oh, I didn't mention this in my recent video, which is that I thought I wanted to draw manga. So then what I did was I I researched how to draw manga and like, okay, manga is about story. I'm going to learn story writing. So I actually did story writing for a bit first, right? I learned how to draw stories, uh, um, draw stories. I learned how to write stories. I learned story structure. I learned three act structure. I learned how stories were, okay, whatever. And then I'm like, Stories are not meant for me. Writing is not for me. I'm going to try just the drawing part of manga. And then that's where the manga drawing came in. I'm like, hmm, drawing is fun, but manga isn't for me. And then, you know, and then so on. I talked about this in my recent video. Manga isn't for me. And then I tried four pound of manga and then I found, finally found illustration. I'm like, ah, this feels more suited to me. I'm going to keep on this path. And then I kept on doing um, illustration. But yeah, anyway, it's like, I've already forgotten what I was talking about, but anyway, um, back to the back to the question, right? Um, I was spending every hour because I was so unhappy that I spent every hour trying to get away, and so I, you know, I, you know, basically um, quit my job and then just went all in art. I was either gonna make it, I was going to either make it or I was gonna um, essentially like you know die trying making it. So I spent all that time in. I spent. Um, I gave up games. Essentially, I stopped watching anime. I, I stopped everything. I, I basically just went all in on illustration. I, I didn't do anything other than illustration. I don't know if I can recommend that now because you get to a point where you're just so stressed out. Like you get so you get so stressed out, and you start to hate it. It it it's it's weird. I feel like you get it's more efficient to have a bit of release. Like it's it's probably okay to like you know like chill. You know play play. The, you know take a bit of time to enjoy some other things in life than just drawing. I don't think the best way is to just spend every hour, every moment that you're awake, cut everything else out, um, you know, stop, stop everything else, literally stop everything else and just focus on writing. I don't think that's 
the right way to do things, I feel like that's really easy to burn out and you start to actually learn less efficiently because you're so stressed. I don't think that's the right way, but I, I do think that there's a balance where you can, you know, you can try to spend, cut out everything unnecessary, right? Maybe you're spending um, a lot of time on Netflix. If you, and I'm talking only, by the way, I'm only talking for people who, um, who, who are trying to do this as like more of a commercial thing rather than like a hobby. If you're a hobby, this does not apply to you. Absolutely does not apply to you. Like, don't, don't do this. This is a way to hate your hobby really fast. But if you, um, but in some cases you might want to try, um, essentially, if you want to improve fast, you just put everything you have in that one, in that one area and try to go as fast as you can. Yeah. I hope, I hope you, I hope you find that, I hope you find that helpful. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, moderation, trying to find the right moderation for you, right? trying to find the right balance. Overthinking really does suck. I feel you. I feel you. I, I'm an overthinking. I, I'm definitely an overthinker, but I don't know. Like, I feel we all suffer from overthinking. I think it's so common and we just have to find ways to deal with it. Mm -hmm -hmm. Yeah, find a way to make it fun. Toko H um, says, I think you should find a way to make it fun. I think that's absolutely key. Um, I think that's uh, su super key. Like uh, now, because I've tried the be miserable, do put everything in all you have into art until it works try kind of thing. I feel it's, you make progress, but I'm not sure it's sustainable. And I feel like a lot of people that try to do that will eventually just hate it and then um, burn out. So it's like, make it fun. That's absolutely true. That is, that is so true. Um, and you might stick with it longer if you're not absolutely miserable. <laughs> so it's like, it's like that. I, I definitely understand that. Ask Conquest says, I just started and I'm already getting burned out um, and not doing the fun stuff. The start is also hard. Um, that's the one, there's, that's one argument for putting all you have at the start is because the beginner's hell is, is real. Because um, when you're starting out, there's so many things you have to learn that it, it really, it's really tough because there's a lot of, there's like this initial hump first that you need to get over so you can kind of draw okay. But once you start to draw okay, it becomes a upwards, um, a self-fulfilling mot motivation cycle, right? Because once you start to draw okay, I'm like, hey, I'm not so bad. This is pretty cool. And then you got you go into that positive motivation loop, but you do need to put that effort to get over the hump. So that may be the one time you want to really get go through as fast as possible. Like, just put that effort in to get over the initial hump, the bigger cell thing first, and just get a bit past that until you reach Intermediate hell, which is a different kind of hell, but that's for another day. <laughs> How long did you hate drawing? I don't know. Um, it's like a. I don't know if I hated drawing at all. I felt it felt tiring to do. Like I felt less energetic to do. I never hated it because I was really miserable not drawing. <laughs> I was really I was really miserable before. And when you were in that rock bottom kind of thing where. It's like a rock, um, rock top. You should, everything should be doing okay. Like you're a great student. You're like really great. You get scholarships and all that. And you're absolutely miserable, right? That's like, I, drawing was just great. I love drawing. I love what I do now. I love creating. I love making YouTube videos. I love um, helping you guys out. I, I love um, drawing, you know? And I still love the learning journey. I still have so much to learn. Like, uh, and I love it. So it's not hate. I never hated it, but I still, if you if you're just doing it all day, you start to feel less energized, and become it becomes kind of like uh, a, a drag, kind of like a chore to do, right? So there's balance to be had right there. Um, Kaiser asks, when's the best time to draw? Morning or night? Anytime you can draw. Um, the science is there, right? It's like you could be a morning person, you can be a night lark, night owl, morning lark. You could be a morning lark, you could be a night owl. Um, Draw what suits you, man. Like, uh, again, we're all, we're all a bit different, so I can't say do this. Draw when you have time, everything counts. Yeah. There's a few more rapid fire questions, so we'll get to that and then we'll go to comment, um, to comments, uh, the questions in the comments and all that. Okay, Lunar Chisco asks, what motivates you to create art and who are your biggest artistic influences? Ooh, so um, at first, at first, it was that I don't want to be miserable anymore. Like, you know, that I hated my life, so I need to draw. I need to draw. I need to create art <laughs> kind of thing. That, that was my initial thing. Like, the thing was, I, I wanted to, you know, do art because I hated everything else. Um, but getting past that, 
what motivates me now is definitely improving my own skills. It's it's the learning journey. Um, it's being able to help others through these videos and tutorials. Um, it's also recently, right? Um, so I was really into, because I was so into like, I need to get good at art. I need to make this work somehow that I just focus on so much on the technical and I stopped seeing art for what art is, um, which is, I feel, I feel um, art is self-expression. It's like, uh, it's part of ourselves that we're expressing, right? Um, there's this great book on creativity, I think by Rick Rubin that I was reading the other day. And that opened my eyes up because I've always, because I came into art, not as an artist. I came into art more of like an analyzer, like an, a, science, a science kind of mindset, right? Because like the two things I was good at in school was um, Japanese and physics. I was, if I wasn't gonna, um, I wanted, the only reason I didn't do like physics and go into science is because I wanted to learn Japanese because I was hoping that I could somehow, you know, like, I wanted to do something anime related because I loved anime. Um, also, I did teaching because I felt, I think if I remember correctly, I had the mindset of like, if I learn how to learn, then I can learn anything. That did turn out kind of okay. So that, that was not too bad. But anyway, um, I learned recently, I learned that it's like, oh, art is definitely um, self-expression. What gets muddly right now is that because of social media, right? I don't know if it's because of social media. Maybe it's more of a separation between people who just are pure artists doing it purely for self-expression because this is me, this is what I love. I'm going to sh I mean, make it and then it's going to be great. And then there's the people who also do it commercially, which is I have an audience as well to keep in mind. And I want to try to find the balance between what I love, what is authentic to me, what is my self-expression that is authentic to me, but also what the audience wants, which is how can I serve the audience as well? In, in terms of art, it's like, how can I entertain them, right? How can I entertain the audience in my art? Um, if it's in terms of, if you, if, if it's YouTube, it's maybe it's like, how can I help people? So it's that kind of thing. But when it comes to art now, yeah, definitely it's what motivates me now is improving my own skills, being, being able to help others. And when it comes to art influences, there's just too many, there's, there's too many. There's so many people that influenced me. Um, if I had to name one, actually, the artist that made me consider il illustration, getting into illustration, is Fuzi Choco. Her art was amazing. Like, just absolutely breathtaking when I saw her art. So, at the start, I knew that I needed to pick, um, I think I saw some advice on YouTube when it's like, when I was starting my art journey, it's like, pick, pick artists you admire, um, find an artist you admire, and then, you know, start learning from them, essentially, right? So then, I'm like, I have no idea what's in the anime space. I need to buy some art books there. So what I did was I bought some Japanese art books made by Japanese illustrators. I bought like Pixiv, the Pixiv collection stuff, like the Pixiv art book. I bought some some of the other um, Japanese art books that looked good to me. And it was a collection of artists. So it wasn't just one artist's art book, right? And in all of these art books, I circled artists that I'm like, hmm, I think I think I like these artists. These 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 artists are great. These these are very inspiring. But in all of them, there was only there was only one artist that I selected each and every single time, and that was Fuzi Choco's art. It's like it took me. It, it was absolutely breathtaking. I'm like, wow. So if I had to name one, it would definitely be her, who got me into illustration. She's just amazing. You need to check her out. Okay, next question. Congrats on hitting 100k. Hey Ari, your art is amazing, and I'm wondering if you consider making an art book in the near future. Thanks. Um. Definitely want to. I have no idea when or what that process will look like. Um, I definitely want to. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. He asks, congratulations for 100k subscribers. I wonder if you are planning to release your own how to draw books. Um, thanks, Q. This is something I was consider considering, right? Because I think it would be cool to make a how to draw book since the EN anime art community has very limited access to good resources. I don't know what it is right now, right? But when I was starting out learning illustration, right? There was pretty much nothing in English. Or there was very, very limited resources in English, especially on YouTube. Like everyone's kind of, the art style that they did was not very anime. If it was anime, it was, go it was gonna be like a blend between um, more of the Western kind of art style with an anime art style. It wasn't like the Japanese kind of art style that I wanted to do. And I feel, 
that that's still an issue in the Ian Art Committee. Like a lot of the Japanese how to draw books, which are really good, aren't in English. Um, so that's something I want to change as well. I mean, I started this YouTube channel because I want to I wanted to help with that, right? Um, I I wanted, you know, like past Ori didn't have Ori right now. Past Ori didn't have these videos on anime art, and I want to do something. So, um, and thankfully, uh, it seems like a lot of people are finding helpful. So. Yeah, that, I'm really grateful for that, and I'm happy to be able to tell about that. But at the same time, um, I also think I could do a better job with doing it online and doing it digitally. Because if it's physical books, it's really hard. Like, not everyone has access to it, right? It's like very limited in area. But if it's online, everyone will be able to access it equally. And and it's you can do videos and all that. So I don't know, it's like, right? It's like time is limited. If I spend time making an art a physical art book then i can't help as many people but if i make it online and digital and all that um i feel like i can help a lot more people so i don't know i'll i'll have to think about it definitely but yeah can you suggest any um people are asked can you uh, suggest any anime art books anime art books they're all in japanese so, but I've mentioned them in the videos. The really good ones, um, you know, like some of the great ones I've mentioned in the videos, like um, Par Paris How to Draw Hair book is great. Um, Fuzichoko's um, art books are very insightful, but might be, I feel it might be difficult, a bit difficult for um, beginner artists. Um, but yeah. We'll have, and we'll have some more time for um, comment questions from the comments uh, a bit more. We just have a few more rapid fire and then we'll go into comment questions. Um, Abyss says, congrats, I've been looking at your stuff for a while now, and it's helped me grow and understand more about art in general. My biggest question is, what advice would you give your younger self to make your art development smoother? So, advice to my younger self, definitely draw more. I didn't draw that much. I, de I definitely want to, I definitely, I feel like I still could have drawn more like, and stop trying to make things so neat, tidy, and perfect. Um. So I tend to have a habit of trying to make everything like super neat, super tidy, super perfect. Um, I, I get like, it's like, uh, it's it's like, yes, you do want your art to be, um, you know, it looks, to make it look nice, but you don't have to do it in every single pixel. And it's letting go of that need of having every single pixel to be perfect that I feel like I could have done a much better job at. I'm a bit better at it now, but I used to have such a problem where I'd zoom in to this to like one pixels and then it's like, I gotta make this pixel pixel perfect. And that was a complete waste of time because no one does that. <laughs> no one looks at it that much. It's like it's an efficient use of your time. Yes, you, you you it's okay to try to make your you know the face and the character where people are looking at to make it really look nice. That's that's totally fine. But when you're like when it comes to like the background or like some tiny tiny detail it doesn't matter that much you don't need to make it so perfect and tidy so there's a balance right it's like perfectionism is both I, I i don't know i was going to say it's both a blessing and a curse but i'm not i'm not sure if perfectionism is a thing because perfection perfectionism can also be seen as high standards i have high standards for how my art looks like that's a good thing but you might have high standards for things that don't matter that people you know like like i said like the things that don't matter like in the background or like things that people aren't going to look at that might be a, a bad thing because it takes too much time so definitely i could have found that balance better it's like find the balance between what you should have high standards in and what it's okay to not have you know to not to not worry so much about and the third and probably the third advice I give to my yourself is to draw, reflect, learn. I, I really wish I knew the draw, reflect, learn cycle much, much earlier. Like I spent most of my, I spent a long time researching how to study art and it turns out to be the draw, reflect, learn cycle was my conclusion. And I wish I knew it earlier. I would have improved so much faster. Like I, I did a lot of things that didn't work. And eventually I found the thing that did work, which was the cycle. Um, but hey, it's, it's a learning process, right? And because I did the, because I went through all, the, all those failures and all that, um, I, I ended up reaching the conclusion. And, you know, a lot of people found it helpful. So I guess that, that works out. But definitely if I could start, yeah, I would have just gone straight for the draw, reflect, learn cycles. Like, this is how you learn. Draw, reflect, learn. That's it. That's it. That, that's how you learn. You draw, you reflect, and then you learn. And it works for everything. 
It, it literally works for everything in life. If you want to learn, if you want to practice Japanese, you speak Japanese. You reflect on what you spoke and what mistakes you made. You reflect on what your bottom max might be, and then you learn. You find some way to overcome this bottleneck. That's it. Okay, and last one for the rapid fires before we go into the audience questions. Um, okay, so there were a ton of questions about advice for beginners, which I think I already answered on the recent video. So you can just check that out. And yeah, I hope you've already seen the to all these people who ask those questions. I hope you check out the um, the most recent video, the four things I wish I knew when I started learning anime art. Those are exactly what I'd give you, the, the advice I'd give you if, if you were to start learning anime art. Okay, um, I'm going to pick up some questions from the chat right now. So do feel free to to put them in if you have some um, and I'll be picking some that I think that are interesting or will, people will find helpful. Will you make a video with um, some sort of roadmap for new artists and what should practice first? Okay, I actually thought about this. When I was making this four things I wish I knew when I started learning anime art, I had two two different versions of the script. I had one where I gave step-by-step -step instructions. Um, like, okay, this is what I think is the most efficient way to learn um, anime art. Okay, this is what you did in the first month. Um, this is what you did in the first three months. This is what you did in the second three months. This is what you did in the third quarter, whatever. I, I had that. And then the second type of script was the one I put out in this video, which is these are the the principles, the rules um, that you will find useful to follow no matter what style of art you draw. The problem with trying to make a, a what you're asking is, can you make a curriculum for learning anime art? The problem with learning, um, making up, making a curriculum for learning anime art is that everyone's type of art is a bit different. Everyone's style of art that they want to aim is also a bit different and everyone starts at a different point in their journey as well. And, you know, the skills they bring up. It's a bit too... I don't feel like I could do a good job taking into account the needs of everyone if I tried to give a strict structure. I, I know, like, when you're starting out, having, like... Like, I, I definitely feel this. When I was starting out, I'm like, dude, why don't you just tell me do this, do this, do this? Why is everything so vague? Why are the fundamentals so vague? You tell me to do the fundamentals, but it's so it's so vague. It's like, why can't you just tell me to do this? Like, I, I know beginners need that. Beginners need that structure. They need um, these rules. But it's so hard to do that because everyone everyone is, is, is really different. So, and if you try to make advice that's like too too strict, then it's not going to be very helpful for a lot of a whole bunch of other people. So that's a bit hard. Uh, maybe there is a solution and I just haven't put enough thought into these are based on the most effective principles of learning. This is what you would want to do in most cases maybe maybe that's a video i could make um and i just haven't put enough thought out i'll think about it i'll, I'll definitely think about it maybe I'll, I'll learn a bit more you know i develop my own skills and I'm like okay yeah maybe there there is a there is a, there is a one-year path that makes really good uh, that makes really good things okay let's see let's see if there's any other questions that are good Um, 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 Ready asks, how to find your own art style? Is it developed naturally or depend on where you, where to learn and what kind of reference do we use to learn? I think it develops naturally. I don't think you have to worry too much about it. It's weird. I also had this, I also thought the thing. Um, at this time, I also had, you know, there was a phase where I was going through, what is art style? How do I make it? How do I do it? It's like, it turns out that you just, it just comes along naturally and then, like I, I didn't I didn't think I had an art style, but I was talking to it with actually um Fishy who was in the chat, my friend Fishy there. He was in the chat and we were talking and then I'm like, I don't think I have an art style. And it's like, dude, I, I see art, I know it's your art. I'm like, really? Yes, yeah, like everyone else that sees your art knows it's you know, an already piece. I'm like, okay, that's weird. I, I never thought about it, but I, I got it. And then it, it turns out that way because you know, I, I never thought about it as well, but it turns out that that's seems to be the way it works. Yeah, Fishy says we all we all think that. Yeah, it definitely is. Like I see Fishy's piece, I'm like, oh, that's a Fishy piece, easy, right? But and I, I also saw some like other artists into um, interviews. They said the same thing, and it's just like uh, people they think they change the art a lot, but everyone, no one ever she sees that change, and their art is actually very consistent. So it's like you don't have to worry about art style. It it just happens. 
if you're being authentic and like natural to yourself, it becomes your art style, I think. Okay, let's see, there's another question. Um, Donna asks, are days, can I play video games while also being a professional artist or do I need to draw 24 seven? Um, depends on your goals. I always think that um, how hard, how many hours you need to put in depends on what you want to achieve, right? If you, if you want to be the absolute number one pro commercial artist, then you got to do the same amount of work that the other number one pro commercial artists do. But if you're, if you just want to, you know, be pretty, pretty good and all that, then maybe you don't have to be, so um, you don't have to sacrifice every, you know, you don't have to sacrifice your firstborn to the altar of the art god or whatever, right? It's like, um, it really depends. So make your work ethic match your goals. If your ambition is really high, then you probably need to have a really strong work, work ethic. If you're a ho if you're a hobbyist, you, you just want to maximize for fun and, you know, have fun, have fun doing it. Enjoy the journey. Um, let's see, do you listen to music when drawing? Okay, um, multitasking is not a good thing when you're trying to learn, um, I think. This is this is my point of view. I, I think there's some people who can do it. Um, research shows that people, there's people who definitely can multitask, like, I think that's, but it's super, super rare. It's, it's like, unlike, at least it's not me. Um, I can't multitask. So when I'm le learning something, I find it much more efficient to just focus on the one thing. Um, the, the, the research on this, um, there's a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport that you that was basically game changing for me when I figured learned it. Because I originally thought I could listen to audiobooks, I could listen to streams, I could watch streams while drawing, I could listen to music while drawing. Um, but usually the case is that what happens is there's this thing called context switching, which is that. Um, it's a fancy term for saying that your brain keeps switching from task to task. So when you, when you think you're multitasking, what you're actually doing is very quick context switching, which is, okay, you're looking at the stream, then you're looking back on your drawing, then you're listening to the stream, and then you're looking back on your drawing, you're doing these tiny context streams. You are not, your brain actually can't do those two things at once. You're not drawing and watching a stream. You're watching and then drawing, and then watching and then drawing really fast. You're context switching really fast. That's what's actually happening. And that's, there's a cost to that. And it makes your, whatever you're doing um, basically takes more time. So do do look up, um, just just Google like Deep Work by Carl Newport or maybe like a summary of it. Um, and I think you might find it helpful to see the more details on it. But usually you don't want to, especially at the start, you probably don't have that bandwidth yet. Like it, the people who've done it for, um, the people who've drawn forever, right? They've done it for like 10,000, 20,000 hours. It's probably like drawings like automatic. It's like lifting, maybe like lifting a barbell for them. It, it doesn't take much thought because they've done it so many times that they can do it without thinking. So they listen to music, they can talk, um, they can draw at the same time. So if you've done it a lot, then it stops becoming something you have to learn so much, right? And you don't have to put more bandwidth, then you can probably just um, listen to music, do whatever. But when you're learning, it's all new for you. So I don't think you have that bandwidth. So I don't really recommend music. The one, the one thing I do use though, is there's recently, um, it's quite new, I think in the last five years it came out, there's these music services that create, that that put up music that doesn't disrupt your brain thoughts and processes. Um, I don't know if I want to name any of them, but there, there have been music um, there have been music providers that create music specifically that don't interrupt your brain processes. And the music obviously doesn't sound that great. It's not, you know, like the art, you know, great music, but it's not bad. It's okay. And it's better than nothing. So I, I do use some of those services. I've tried a couple. Um, I don't know if I want to name any, but there are services like that if you want to look at it. I don't know if you can find them on YouTube. I'm not sure, but yeah, but there are alternatives for that one. What's it called? Um, all right, I'll say the name. I'm not sponsored. I'll just say the name though because I use them. It's Focus. Um, Focus at Will is what I use. They have like these, you know, like um, brain, it's like music thing. But I don't know if I want to recommend it too much because it's expensive. It's like, I don't think you need to spend that money on it. It's like, maybe you can just listen to like um, calming music on YouTube. I don't know if, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Maybe, maybe I'll change my mind. I'm like, okay, maybe this is something I recommend, but... I think you can Google it. They are not the only one 
So do 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 your research. Do, do check out other things. Um, but <laughs> the music is not that you know. Obviously, the brain music tailored to make your brain not not you know not interrupt your brain process isn't going to be that good as real real music. But yeah. <laughs> Flamebringer says ten hour fan noise. Yeah, white noise is actually um. There's a lot of research saying I think I think there's a lot of research, if I remember correctly. This might be an ori fact. Maybe I'm making things up. But I think I've read some research that like white noise is helpful. Um, with that kind of stuff as well. It, anyway, um, <laughs> too much, too much, too much time on that question. Let's go on to the next another question. Um, oh wow, there's a lot of questions. Let me just see if I missed any that were good. There's a lot of technical questions, which is a bit hard to do in a Q through a Q and A. So um, I see your technical questions. Um, uh, I definitely plan to make more technical tutorials in the future. So do wait for them. Um... Is it alright to consider arts as a main career, even if I'm not talented? It's not talent. Like if, if you, well, I hope what you're getting from my videos is that it's it's not talent. I don't think I've ever mentioned talent once in my videos because it's all about skills. It's it's skills. It's learning skills. It's building skills. It's learning. It's ga um getting exp points. It's literally like a game. You are building your skills up. You can improve through that. Um, Read mastery, right? The book by Robert Greene. I was recommending earlier on, earlier on in the stream. Whereas like every great master did go through an apprenticeship phase of like five to ten years. Since we're learning Japanese were early early on in the stream. For when drawing, do you collect references? Yes, I do. People are asking like, is it okay to draw this? Is it okay to do this? I think you can just do what you want to do. Like, I don't think you have to follow, you know, like, I think, I think you don't have to take what is relevant and helpful to you from what I say. I don't think you have to like strictly follow everything that I say. I feel like you can make your own choices and say, and say like, um, because we're all different in a bit, in a different way. Like I try to give advice that's, based on like the principles that I know is usually is it's based on solid principles and you know the science and research I try to give that but um then again it's also up to you that for you to make your own choice on what to apply and what you want at what you want to apply maybe you don't want to apply it because there is something that you want else you do that's that's okay I, I'm really okay with that like if you feel like you need to do something else then that's that's totally okay okay maybe we'll just do two more questions since we're getting over um this is starting to get really long so let's just do two more questions and then we'll call it a day um so last two questions It's, um yeah so there's some questions on mentorship so i've mentioned this before in the fastest way to learn video right men mentorship is there but it's hard to find in english it's just because there's not that many english artists drawing anime art i feel right i think the anime boom and all that happened quite recently for the end world um but it's always been there for japan obviously and maybe like Cor um, korea china maybe i'm not sure i can't really say I, I don't know too much about it but definitely in japan right because it's originated from there so there's definitely like schools and whatnot and teachers and more mentors are more available there um so it's tough to find in english i don't know you could search for it i guess 
Um, yeah, it's hard to say that in English is just so limited. Um, maybe there are artists who do it through their um, Patreon or whatnot, right? Uh, I'm not sure. The easiest one is, of course, they offer it through their Patreon or or service of some sort. Um, the the other way, um, so Robert Greene in his book Mastery also talks about finding a mentor, which I did find helpful, but um, I don't know if it, just because of the language barrier that, it's like the language barrier is just like there, right? It's so hard to get over, so maybe you could find an EN artist. Sorry, I don't really have a good um, advice for that because the language barrier is definitely a thing, so maybe you could learn Japanese. And then, uh, and then apply for one of the Japanese ones. Or maybe you just have to wait until um, the EN anime art community becomes bigger in five to 10 years. And then there's more experienced artists and they start offering mentorship services. Arjun says, thank you. Your tips have imp helped improve my art. Glad to hear that. That's, that's why I make these videos. That's why I make these streams. Um, yeah, my, my pleasure. It's my, um, my honor. How deep, um, Peroran asks, how deep of an anatomy knowledge you need to have for a stylized drawing like anime? Or is it enough to just learn the forms? Anime, art, anatomy, you do need to know to be able to draw the figure. It needs to look correct, you know, in proportions. It's helpful to know the muscles, but it depends how stylized it your art is. I'm not sure if you need to go like super, super deep because for anime, you usually aren't going to be... It depends on the art style. Again, everything depends on what you do. Um, but you usually don't need to go super deep on the anatomy, like deep, what are deep muscles and all that. I did those courses. I have those art uh, anatomy books. I went super deep into them. They're okay. They were knowledge. It's like it, knowledge, but I never really end up using too much. I learned the, the basic fundamentals were great. Like, you know, like these are the trapezius, chest, chest, um, you know, shoulder muscles. These are the pecs, the, the, the chest muscles, right? These are, those were great. But I'm not sure you need to know like the deeper, like the nitty gritty and all that. I'm not sure if you need to know that. So probably, probably the advice I can give is just start by learning some of it. And if you find that you need to learn more, then go deeper. If you find that you don't need to learn more, then stick um, stick with it. You can always adjust, right? You can just learn for a bit and then do a second round later when you, if you need if you feel you need to level up more. Okay, I think I covered most of the other questions. A lot of the other questions people are asking now have been answered early on in the stream, so you can check that out. And yeah, I think that's it. So, do thanks for joining me on this celebration stream and. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe. Do check out the latest videos because that answers a ton of questions that people ask about what to do as a beginner. And I'm also on Twitter and that's where I post all my art. So do follow me there as well. Um, yeah, this was Ori. Hope you have a great rest of the day. And thanks for joining, joining this. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.